We've been here to the United States a lot. We used to come every uh, every year for uh, for a vacation, and we really liked uh, the U.S. We saw it's uh, it's a great country. This is a huge country. This is a beautiful country. This country uh, is country for everybody. That's right. That's why we, we decided we wanted to continue our life and, and uh, move here to the U.S. and uh, have a future here in the U.S. The Megahids are the perfect picture of an American immigrant family. Samir Megahid, an engineer, moved from Egypt with his wife and four children to a quiet cul-de-sac in Tampa, Florida in 1998. Samir found work and his eldest sons followed in his footsteps pursuing engineering degrees. In 2009, the family celebrated becoming American citizens, but their son Yusuf was missing. That two guys supposed to be out of Florida. Both of them are sitting holding Qurans in their lap while they're driving. One's got a laptop. Well, I think they're part of the damn Taliban. Well, I got a Taliban, though. Well, they got me scared. Because if I got a mom strapped to him and shit, Maybe they're going to practice suicide bombing here. Hey, man. Not, not right now. I like the Islamic. Are they Islamic? My friend told us, how is Yusuf? We told him he, he's fine. He went to a beach trip with some of his friends. He told us, did you see uh, CNN? And we were amazed that he was telling us to check Yusuf on CNN. In August 2007, Yusuf Magahed was on a road trip with his college friend Muhammad, visiting beaches in the south. They were pulled over for driving 60 in a 45-mile-an-hour zone in the small South Carolina town of Goose Creek. But when Muhammad told the officers he had homemade fireworks in the car, they were both arrested and charged with transporting explosives across state lines. We saw this uh, as a mistake that will hopefully will be, uh, be solved by the next day. But then the story didn't end the next day and it continued now for almost two years. He was arrested with uh, fireworks. If any white, white kid or, uh, or anyone who, who's, who's not a Middle Eastern would, would be uh, stopped by a police officer and he would have fireworks, they would consider this to be uh, uh, something ordinary and they are going to the beach and they are having some fun. But for a Middle Eastern, even this legal stuff that is enjoyed or, or allowed for any, any person living here in the U.S., he, uh, it's considered to be uh, banned or illegal for him. So I think it was almost like a wake-up call that uh, like Arabs and Middle Easterns and people from, from an Islamic uh, background, they don't, they don't enjoy the same rights or same freedoms offered to other people here in the U.S. Although no formal charges of terrorism were ever filed, Yusuf was held for 10 months in solitary confinement. It was over a year and a half before his trial began. In the past two years, our life is changed completely. It is, looks like a nightmare. Uh, you live under pressure from the biggest government all over the world. If the biggest government all over the world targeting your son, and you know your son is innocent, you're thinking it's crazy. Because Yusuf has a Middle East face and he's carrying Quran, his suspicion on him. to justify their hatred. Stop all Muslim immigration. Is that the best way to protect America and our economy from new terror attacks? Oh, the fact of the matter is, these guys want to kill us. We have to fight them. And we have to support law these enforcement. Guys these guys want to fight them. You know, Clinton goes all over the map here. We got to get these guys before they and kill us. that's got to be the last If you word. are an 18 to 28 year old Muslim man, then you should be strip searched. So there's Thank always you. confusion about Islam. Is it a religion of violence or peace? Islam is a violent 
I was going to say religion, but it's not a religion. It's a political system. It's a violent political system bent on the overthrow of the governments of the world and the, and and world domination. In the years since the September 11th attacks, advocacy groups claim that the United States has witnessed an anti-Muslim and anti-Arab backlash. Issam Zayem is president of the Cleveland Office of the Council on American-Islamic Relations, or CARE. Nationally, CARE has tracked a five-fold surge in civil rights complaints by Muslim Americans since 2001. The uh, atmosphere and the environment and the media had created a very uh, false perception about Islam and Muslims, especially American Muslims. So uh, we were all lumped in uh, the categories of uh, the fifth column or the terrorists. If you look into the major cities in the country, you will find that uh, there has been uh, major cases all over the country. The Department of Justice is waging a deliberate campaign of arrest and detention to protect American lives. We're removing suspected terrorists who violate the law from our streets to prevent further terrorist attack. We believe we have Al-Qaeda membership in custody, and we will use every constitutional tool to keep suspected terrorists locked up. The U.S. Department of Justice refuses to release a tally of how many people it has detained since the beginning of its so-called War on Terror. From 2001 to 2003 alone, however, at least 27,000 Arabs and Muslims inside the United States were detained and interrogated by the FBI, and 7,000 arrested. 145,000 Arab and Muslim immigrants were questioned as part of a special registration program, and of those, nearly 14,000 had deportation proceedings started against them. Sami Hamoudi was a PhD student in applied anthropology and an instructor at the University of South Florida the same university Yusef Magahed attended as an engineering student. He and his family had moved to Tampa from Palestine in 1992 so Sammy could pursue his studies. In 2003, he was arrested as a co-conspirator in the Sami al-Aryan case and charged with terrorism. Today the United States Department of Justice is announcing the indictment of Sami al-Aryan and seven co-conspirators. All of the defendants if convicted, face the potential of life sentences. al Arian's U.S. associates and Palestinian Islamic Jihad members arrested today include Sama Hamouda. At the very beginning of the case, I thought that there are misunderstandings. They came around 4 a.m., 4 in the morning. They just came knocking on the door very strongly and my wife woke up and we opened the door then they came to me and said you are under arrest for charges of terrorism for supporting terrorism. Rabia Haddad came to the U.S. to study in 1980 fleeing the violent civil war in Lebanon. After a career with various aid organizations in 1992 Haddad founded the Global Relief Foundation or GRF it became the second largest Islamic charity in the United States, providing aid to 680,000 people worldwide. In 2001, he was living in Ann Arbor, Michigan with his wife and four young children. He worked as the chairman of GRF and volunteered as an imam at the local mosque. Three months after 9-11, the government designated his charity a terrorist entity. They raided our offices December 14th. It was a Friday. and. Uh, uh, I remember coming home after the Friday prayer. I felt that I was uh, being followed coming back from the mosque. Uh, but I didn't think, you know, I thought, well, if they're raiding our offices in Chicago, it's, I think, normal to put me under surveillance or, you know, whatever. Uh, but then maybe an hour after that, they knocked at my door and uh, arrested me, and things went downhill from there. The theory that uh, gave, uh, let's say, legitimacy to all, uh, in, in their thought, to all of these actions was uh, Muslims and Arabs are either terrorists or potential terrorists. So we have to do things to control 
these communities. And this is what they did. And this is what they are still doing. Nothing changed. Back in Tampa, Yusuf's court-appointed lawyer, Adam Allen, worried that the prevailing political and media climate would make his case nearly impossible to win. Initially, obviously, when you are appointed to represent somebody from the Middle East originally, who is charged with the transportation of explosive materials, as a defense lawyer, you have some great concerns um, about the ability to successfully represent this individual. The media reaction was, was that this was some sort of terrorist-related activity. Um, the United States Attorney's Office, although not saying that, certainly wasn't saying it wasn't. Um, and, and that sort of swelled around this case. Gary Merringer served as the foreman of the jury in Yusuf Magahid's trial. He says the tone for the trial was set on the very first day. The judge asked, does anybody here consider themselves an expert with explosives? And, then, and he followed that with, is anybody here fluent in Arabic? <laughs> and, and not knowing at all, when you go into being paneled on a jury, you don't know anything about the case. Uh, just some person sitting there in a business suit, and, and all of a sudden I'm hearing uh, Arabs and explosives, and it's like, whoa. I mean, if you ask the man on the street, hey, the defendant's from the Middle East, and he's, the government's alleging he's got explosive materials in his trunk. All of my colleagues said, there's no way you're going to win this at trial. We listened to almost two full weeks of evidence. 40-plus um, witnesses were put on by the government. I don't know how many documents. It was, I think, over 100. As the evidence came in, and, the, and, it, and it kept pointing away from Yusuf, and it kept showing that, you know, if even though there was no physical evidence tying him to it, once it became clear that these items were completely harmless, I felt we, we, we should win at trial and we could win at trial. The jury, after three days of looking hard and fast at the evidence, said, you know, it's the burden of the government to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was in possession of these materials and that he knew it. It's not, it's not sufficient that you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You're not guilty of a crime in this country. And, and there was, the feeling was, you know, there really wasn't any evidence uh, of that. When the verdict was not guilty, it was a wonderful feeling. Um, there were tears from the client and the family, and probably the best hug I've ever received from my client's father. Um, several of the Agents that worked for the FBI came up and congratulated us and told us that they were not dissatisfied with the verdict in the case. Um, and it was good to know, um, and I think I was even quoted in the paper as saying, you know, the system worked. As a lawyer who, who tries cases and, and, and understands the Constitution and the purpose of jury trials and, and the whole notion that the jury is the true representation of our government. It's a check on our government, and it's in, it's it's what makes us America. Is that it's not the government that decides whether somebody's guilty. It's the community because we are government of the people, and the people in this case, despite all the government's best efforts, said, "You know what? You're wrong." It was about one of the proudest days I've ever had as a lawyer professionally. Um, it was wonderful. We went in and talked to the judge. Uh, he counseled us never to talk to anybody ever again about anything that had happened. And as a result of that, we all took all of our notes and all the charts and everything, and we just gave them to the bailiff to shred and burn and, and thinking we would never, ever revisit this. Well, he was acquitted of federal explosives charges just this past Friday, but today Yusuf Megahead is back in the hands of federal agents, and his family tonight is outraged. On Friday, after a three-week trial, Yusuf Megahead walked out of a Tampa courthouse a free man. I'm very happy. Megahead was acquitted on all counts of federal explosives charges, but his freedom was short-lived. Monday, to the surprise of his father, Megahead was arrested all over again. They arrest my son. They kidnap my son. Samir Megahead, Yusuf's father, says they were walking out of this Walmart on Bruce B. Downs when more than a dozen customs enforcement agents surrounded them. They separated between me and my son, and they surround me. I tried to use the telephone. They didn't allow me to use the telephone, 
and put the Yusuf in a small car. I tried to stop in front of this car to let Yusuf to speak to the, his uh, lawyer. They didn't allow me to do this thing. They kidnapped my son. I would have personally walked him to wherever he needed to be, but instead they chose to surveil him for days after the trial and to arrest him and his father as they are walking out of a grocery store and to surround them by cars and agents and whisk him away in a vehicle. Tuesday morning, I got to work, I opened up my browser, pulled up the news, and I saw that uh, Youssef had been arrested on Monday at a Walmart with his dad by immigration authorities. And this has only happened, and a couple, I was thinking about this this morning, when I saw the Grand Canyon was another example, but where the air got sucked out of my lungs. I read the story and I was like, <gasps> like that. It just was so improbable. Um, after all the time we had spent to find out that he hadn't done anything. I spend a lot of my time telling the government they're wrong. That's what federal public defenders do. We tell the government they're wrong. And we argue that they're wrong and we argue what they're trying to do to our clients is wrong. But we respect the system and we were a part of the system and we believe in the system. At that moment in time, not only did I not want to be a part of the system, but I didn't want to be an American. Um, I was no longer proud of our system, and I was certainly not proud of our government. Hello, I'm a youth. Is it a youth? I'm a little. Hey Yusuf, how are you? You holding up all right? Okay. All right. Well, you know, I know this has been a long haul and I know it's difficult, but you just got to try to, you know, hang in there as best you can. Many a time, you know, I'd be sitting in my cell all alone and I would have this slit in the wall that was about maybe five inches wide. That was the only window to the outside world. I would only see shadows and, you know, the, the colors of the sunset, but never really the sun. And I would sit there and, and wonder if I'm ever going to see a sunset again. Uh, of course, to this day, not a single charge has been filed against GRF or against any of the employees of GRF, including myself. I was uh, acquitted from all charges, and in the media, the jurors were saying that we didn't know why they brought him to the case. They took the first decision in half an hour. They voted without any discussion that I was innocent of all charges. They didn't have enough to bring criminal charges to charge me uh, as a criminal, as a terrorist. The only accusation they would make against me is that I had overstayed my visa. I was acquitted. The second day in the morning, uh, ICE came. My attorney asked the judge to release me, but the judge uh, wouldn't accept that. The lawyer had told them that, like, he should be out in, like, two or three days just until they process the paperwork and everything. And we kept waiting, and then they transferred him to the immigration facility. And every time we would keep trying, like for the first, I think, week or two, like even like my dad's lawyer couldn't get any information on what's going on. It wasn't something that was like unheard of, and it wasn't something like that I thought couldn't ever happen because I saw it happen, or I've heard of it happening, but it was just, I didn't expect it to happen to my father. I was denied bond based on the fact that uh, they considered me a danger to the community. When my whole community was actually demonstrating and protesting and what have you. And they were treating me like the most dangerous, worst criminal ever. When I was taken from my cell to my first uh, immigration hearing, 
the, the security they, they had was unbelievable. They had uh, a sheriff's deputy stationed almost every 10 feet all the way from the door of my cell to uh, the building almost next door. My trial was uh, behind closed doors. I was put in solitary confinement on a floor all by myself in, very tight, in a very tight cell. And they had a camera fixed right on me. Uh, the, the cell door had a small window and the camera was right there. It was clear then that it, this wasn't about immigration or me overstaying my visa or anything like that. They were going after me with everything they got. One time I passed through the uh, room, observation room of the guard, and I saw my picture there. So I asked one of the guards why my picture is there. He said, because uh, you are uh, a threat and we have to keep an eye over you for 24 hours. And this was from ICE. They gave them this information. The thing that got to me the most was just not knowing, like not knowing what's going to happen, not, not knowing whether you, I won't be able to see him again, whether he'll, you know, just be there for like these major events in our lives. Very quickly, we presented to ICE that I have a passport. I don't have. I don't need a visa. I can go tomorrow to my country, and I am willing to do that. They said, no, we have to wait, we have to wait. You'll try appealing, and then there would be different court dates, and like nothing would come out of it, and then different promises. And then at the end, they told us, if you just leave voluntarily, we promised he'll be on the flight with you. We kept expecting to find my father there, and he didn't show up. At the end, the immigration officer, he told my mom, he's like, I can't respond to your questions anymore. After almost three years in prison, two of those in solitary confinement, Sami Hamoudi was found innocent of all terrorism charges. But instead of being released, he was transferred to an immigration jail. For six months, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, refused to either release or deport him, even after he agreed to voluntary deportation to reunite with his family. Hamoudi's lawyers brought ICE to court. Two days before the trial, Hamoudi was deported in secret. So on the 23rd, they took me to the airport and deported me. So it wasn't their uh, plan to deport me this way. If we didn't go to the federal judge and ask him uh, to release, either release me or deport me, they wouldn't do that. We didn't even know because it was we were used to him calling and then he didn't call for two days, so we didn't know what was going on. And um, my mom called the, his lawyer and he didn't like have an idea of what's going on and we kept trying to get in touch with people. And like she was kind of freaking out because it was just, you couldn't get in touch with him. No one knew what was happening to him. It's the humiliation of, uh, you know, being deported and traveling in a t-shirt and sweatpants and prison shoes and having these agents with you it's especially for somebody who has my good name and my reputation are the only assets I have in this world. I mean, you know, I don't have any money in any bank accounts. I don't have any land. I don't have any. So this is the only thing I have. And the U.S. government uh, made sure to to attack me on these on these two. They have ruined my reputation. They have ruined my good name and they have accused me unjustly of things that are complete fabrications. Um, they, they could not prove anything because there was nothing there. But uh, with the USA Patriot Act, they didn't have to prove anything. It was enough for the government to say, we suspect. They think that accusing people, destroying their lives, is something they can do. This is what worries me. It is the, the uh, arrogance of the powerful. Sometimes I think back and I don't even know. Like it still seems like a dream away. 
and I don't really know how we got through all of it. It seems like it was something that even happened to someone else. America before, I won't say before September 11th, America before the USA Patriot Act was one thing, and after the USA Patriot Act it was a completely different country. Uh, it, I will not be exaggerating if I said America today is a police state just like any other third world police states. It is actually the dark ages. It is the mentality of the dark ages, where governments could do anything they want to do. In criminal court, the burden of proof is with the prosecution. They would have to make their case, they would have to prove. In immigration, all they have to do is just cast doubt upon you. They do whatever they want to do. And they have the laws, they have uh, everything they want to lie, even lie. All these things that you hear about freedom and you know equality and all these other things, it just seemed like more and more of a facade and it was just... I don't know, like the hypocrisy was just kind of overwhelming and it was, and just having to deal with that uncertainty on a daily basis was just very nerve-wracking and very exhausting. And we join Yusuf's family as they go to visit Yusuf in prison, a three-hour drive from their house in Tampa into the southern swamps of Florida. It has been almost five months since Yusuf has been imprisoned, awaiting his deportation hearing. It is now just two days away. Samir Megahid, Yusuf's father, tries to remain hopeful. We are so patient and we can wait. But this life of my son, they want to destroy him by putting him in a jail, waiting for his winning after one week, one month, one year. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. I'm going to advise him to be patient, to be in good condition in front of the judge, to let the judge know the truth about this case. Yusuf's trial is held in the Chrome Jail in the swamps outside Miami. ICE has flown in a team of four lawyers to try the case. Yusuf's lawyer, Charles Cook, has agreed to take the case for free. No cameras are allowed inside. Uh, we are currently in the second day of the trial. We just finished the testimony of the government's first witness, both his cross-examination and uh, his direct examination. What's at stake is what young Muslim men in America can do and act like uh, in America today. The reality here is, if you're a Muslim in America, you can't think like everybody else. You can't think like your colleagues. I have another client that we went to lunch with a few weeks ago who's about the same age as Yusuf. And I was telling him about Yusuf's case, and it was very interesting what he said. He had very little sympathy for Yusuf. He said, what is he thinking in America as a Muslim man? You can't go surfing on the internet, look at sites. You can't hang around with other people that are Muslims and talk about Islam. And I frankly find that sad. David Cole is a law professor at Georgetown University Law Center and an expert in constitutional and First Amendment rights. He says that the targeting of immigrants in America is nothing new. Historically, whenever the United States has faced a security threat, uh, it has responded by targeting immigrants with its most restrictive measures. Uh, and I think that's partly because it's easy to do so. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing to say to American people, we face a greater security threat. You've got to sacrifice some of your liberties and rights in order to protect the country. Um, but it's another thing to say to American people, we face a, 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 a greater security threat, um, but we're going to give you more security by sacrificing somebody else's rights, uh, namely uh, foreign nationals, immigrants, people who have no voice in the political process. We did it in 1919 after a series of terrorist bombs. We went out and rounded up thousands of foreign nationals on pretextual charges, charges of guilt by association. Not one of them was ever found to have been involved in any of the bombings. During World War II, we rounded up thousands and thousands of Japanese immigrants. This kind of anti-immigrant targeting 
has been a constant feature in the United States at every point that we've had a security crisis. When you want to take action before somebody has actually done anything wrong, well, the criminal law doesn't really allow you to do that, generally. Criminal law requires you to have some proof that an individual has either committed a terrorist act or has conspired to commit a terrorist act or has attempted to commit a terrorist act. Uh, it requires that you put the evidence on the table, that you give a person a fair trial. But if you use immigration law, uh, you can find all sorts of pretextual charges to use against people. Uh, the government employs secret evidence often in uh, immigration procedures. The same sort of fair trial rights don't uh, necessarily apply. The Supreme Court has said that it's permissible to selectively single out people for uh, immigration enforcement based on their affiliation with political groups. So the same sets of protections and rights don't exist, makes it easier to use the immigration process. Dan Vara was the highest ranking ICE attorney in the state of Florida from 2003 to 2006. He says that after the September 11th attacks, he began working closely with the FBI. His prosecutions became a model for using immigration courts as an arm of counterterrorism across the country. Two, three days after 9-11, people like myself uh, got the word from Washington that some of those obstacles that we had to doing some of the cases that we had been preparing for years uh, were no longer there. And we were allowed to move forward and identify people uh, for charges uh, to be taken into detention and to be prosecuted, again, not criminally, but for the purpose of removing them from the United States. In Florida, once we uh, began our, our work with the Joint Terrorism Task Force and even its precursor, just the uh, FBI and other loosely associated groups, uh, our involvement was day to day. We shared, at, again, at the height of my prosecution experience, uh, FBI would feed me information every day. Vara is proud of his work with the FBI and defends the tactic of seeking the deportation of residents against whom no criminal charges can be proven. Many people um, get prosecuted and get acquitted and they're guilty. When you sit at the table with other prosecutors from other branches of the U.S. government and agents from all these agencies and you're reviewing evidence, I mean, the goal is to find the way to deal with the threat. And if, if the only thing you have is tax fraud, if the only thing you have is an immigration violation, then, frankly, that's what you use. An, an immigration charge is administrative in nature. The burden of proof is less than they are in a, in a criminal trial. So even though you got acquitted in a criminal trial, the reality is that the government could still meet its burden if clear and convincing evidence. There are so many people that put their fingers in every single terrorism case that I would tell you unequivocally that mistakes are not made. In terms of identifying actual terrorists, uh, the government has been very uh, ineffective. Uh, so for example, uh, in the first um, two years uh, after 9-11, the government uh, locked up, mostly using immigration powers, over 5,000 foreign nationals, almost all Arab and Muslim, in anti-terrorism preventive detention measures. Of those 5,000, not one stands convicted today of any kind of terrorist offense. So the government's record there is zero for 5,000. They don't have the evidence in these cases, and that's what they see as the beauty of immigration court, is heck, you don't need evidence. You just need a judge who's willing to look at all the garbage evidence and then make a conclusory statement that I think you've met the burden of proof. Thank you very much. Have a nice life. Arguably, anything is the proper use of the immigration laws. Congress has designed it to be, in many ways, like the tax laws that cut Al Capone. Well, if we can't get them on the criminal charges where we have to meet this incredibly high burden of proof, we'll just deport somebody on an incredibly vague immigration statute. These immigration courts are part of the Department of Justice. They are an executive. This is not a judicial branch. This is not an independent judiciary. This judge was appointed by a previous attorney general. He works for the attorney general. These FBI agents work for, oddly enough, the same attorney general. The folks that are prosecuting this case at Homeland Security are also in the executive branch. The reality is you have the executive branch being both the prosecutor, judge, and jury in this case. We should all be concerned about that. We should be concerned that there is a complete lack of judicial independence here. Why would an immigration judge whose boss is the one 
presumably, that wants to prosecute and deport this man say, I'm sorry, boss, you're wrong. Boy, it would take a judge with a great deal of courage to do that. Many people focus on uh, the Bush administration and particularly on 9-11 uh, and the reaction to 9-11 and on, for example, the Patriot Act. Um, but what, what you miss when you focus in that way is that this is a broader problem. Now we're in the middle of the Obama administration. Attorney General Holder has approved this. Trust me, if he hadn't approved it, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So clearly the Obama administration is continuing the same enforcement mentality that first Clinton and then the Bush administration followed in immigration. It's being, there's involvement at the highest levels. The Secretary of Homeland Security, I would be very surprised if that person was not, uh, Janet Napolitano was not involved in this case. I would be very surprised that, that if that was the case. Uh, not only because it's a terrorist case, but because of the publicity that it's getting. A local Islamic group is speaking out about immigration officials' decision to detain Yusuf Megahead. Having a fair trial and, and the jury finding not guilty, it seems like a slap in the face. Their backup plan was to punish them in immigration. Yusuf was arrested for one reason and one reason only, and that's because he looked Muslim. With Yusuf's trial already underway, protests by community, religious, and civil rights groups continue to grow. In an unusual move, four of the jurors from his criminal trial, including foreman Gary Merringer, begin speaking out on Yusuf's behalf. This just doesn't, doesn't seem right. There are things under the law that were put into effect after 9-11 that allows the government to simply say, we think you're a terrorist, and therefore you will be detained until you have your day in court. And there's no judicial review of that determination. It's, it's just a unilateral determination made by immigration officials. We didn't know whether Yousef should be deported or given full citizenship and allowed to finish engineering school. What we did know a lot about was the case we saw in federal court. And based on that case, he was not guilty of anything whether it's beyond a reasonable doubt or by a preponderance of the evidence as might be required in immigration court or by any measure that we saw, this, this kid, was, has, there was no evidence that he had done anything wrong. It's like telling the government, if that's all you got, uh, let him go. I've been doing criminal defense work for 15 years and I've never seen, never heard of jurors going to the media and saying how outraged they are about what the government is doing to somebody who they just stand, stood in judgment of. It's amazing um, that, they, that they would do that. Um, but I think it says something even more about the disconnect between our government policies and what the people who live in this country want. If I do talk to somebody about this case, what positive can come about it for me, not forget about Yousef for a minute, is there anything good that can happen? And the answer is no, but um, this is what I need to be doing. I would really like to think at the end of the day, I did everything possible I could to get him a fair shake. I was a history major um, and during the pre-American Revolution, um, what jurors were doing and the verdicts that they were turning down and, and offenses that were being prosecuted by then the British government um, was the same sort of thing. It was, we're not gonna enforce these laws, these laws are wrong, what you're doing is wrong. Um, and that's what these jurors are saying, what you're doing is wrong. We, you know, the law may allow you to do this, but it's wrong. What do you think is gonna happen at this time? Well, based on the evidence that I know of, it ought to be, um, a very short uh, finding of not guilty, but based on what I've heard about the immigration courts, the immigration judges, the influence of the government, the fact they can put on evidence and not even have to show it to the defense, what I think is going to happen is he's going to be found guilty as some sort of uh, terrorist aider and a better whatever and sent back, well, yeah, it's funny, sent back, but sent to Egypt where he hasn't lived since he was, I think, 11 years old.
At first I was shocked because I knew the family very well and I knew the Mujahid family, I knew their son, I knew how good he was and I have a son. So I was scared. They told him, you know what, I'm not, I don't feel you know, comfortable for you. What if they did the same thing to you? So it made me feel unsafe. It made me feel scared for my kids. But I felt like I can't let the fear take over me. And I start thinking, right, you know, he, we have rights. We're American citizens. That we should fight this. It shouldn't take this route because this is wrong. And if we don't fight now, everybody else are scared, afraid, and they're going to hide away from it. So we thought we could fight it together. And I felt, you know, we can do it. If we as a community work together, we can do it. Give me a kind of, you know, strength to stand up and fight. And the more you learn about your rights, you have to stand up for your rights. We had a privilege to fight for our rights and speak our minds and, and have the freedom to, to practice our religion, not because I'm wearing a headscarf that means I'm suspect, not because I'm a Muslim, I'm a suspect. And maybe, you know, with all of us tonight, you know, are united as a community, Muslims, non-Muslims, everybody else, uh, work together to solve this problem. No profiling whatsoever. We will be all safe, because that will be justice. Yusuf is a guy whose family, his mother and his father and his oldest brother uh, naturalized, but they're having mixed feelings because their son is still being uh, held by immigration authorities. So please make do off for the family. Um, and uh, keep tab on the case and uh, support in any way you can. When anyone in our community, or even in a minority community, sees this case, especially because this family is immigrants, they see themselves, and they see what could happen to them, and uh, they, I think they're concerned now more than ever, um, especially everything that's been happening in our community with this case or nationwide. Um, but the main point here is that we have to be aware as Americans, all Americans. One week into the trial, just as the defense is about to present its case, the judge makes an unexpected announcement. Uh, the immigration judge terminated removal proceedings. Uh, he did the right thing. Uh, when the judge walked into the courtroom today, and he said, the first thing he said was, we're going to go over the exhibits in the case. I knew at that point we had won because otherwise he never would have talked about the exhibits before I had presented a case. As soon as I realized that, I turned, turned over to uh, Youssef and I said, I put my hand on his leg and I said, you won. I don't think he understood me. He looked at me and he didn't understand and Dustin, my co-counsel, leaned in and said, you won the case. And then his big old grin, you should smile now, and a big old grin came on his face. He now understands what a great victory this is, for, frankly, for justice in America. Uh, the government presented a case today and the last four days it was junk it was all about junk and as a result the judge finally realized what it was and dismissed it now, this is the second time in my 20-year career that a judge has dismissed charges against somebody and terminated proceedings based upon the government's lack of evidence so this is a very unique happening for me and really for any immigration lawyer outside the chrome jail supporters and press wait until sundown for yusuf's release i'm very happy for this and I'm looking forward to go back to university. <laughs> I'm feeling so happy for return my son to spend the Ramadan with us. It is the first night of Ramadan. We feel so happy by having my son to our house again. And I want to send a message for the government that this family, family of Megahed, came to this country to live in peace and to work and take the, their degrees. Let us finish this thing. Please let us, Megahed, the family, live here in peace. Thank you. I think it's all over now. I'm happy. Yusuf is one of the very few who beat their charges in both criminal and immigration court. Despite no charges ever being filed against him, Rabia Haddad was deported to Lebanon in 2003. After being found innocent of all charges, Sami Hamoudi was held by ICE and then finally deported to Palestine. He now teaches political science at Berzait University.
They both say that the America that they left is nothing like the country they were once proud to call home. When people ask me about living in the U.S., this is before September 11th, uh, as compared to Lebanon or, or other parts of the world, I would always make the comment that everything else aside, it's still uh, a country of law where everybody is equal under the law. I felt uh, happy in the United States because I felt for the first time that I am free to think the way I want to think, to write the way I want to write, to go uh, wherever I want to go. It's uh, the opposite, 100%. I did not expect what happened after September 11th. To this day, the government can walk into anybody's home, into any company, any firm in the US, freeze their accounts, confiscate all their documents on the basis of doubt. All they have to do is to say, we suspect you of terrorist activity. In the United States, there is no justice. This is what I believe in, and this is what I teach my students. I don't believe that now inside the United States, anyone can say anything he wants. No. The American Muslims and Arabs are not exercising their full rights as other Americans. They cannot, because they will be punished. And the government has many ways to punish people if they want to. And one time, Ashcroft said, said, if someone spit in the street, we can try him. We can make laws to try him and put him in jail, if we want. Civil liberties, human rights, the Bill of Rights are all things of the past. This whole matter of democracy and liberty and, and the rule of law and it's, it's just a myth now. It's just a myth. Any Muslim or any Arab living in the U.S. and hearing me say this um, will not think twice about it. He, they, they know it, they feel it, they're living it. But I hope that other um, U.S. citizens don't uh, end up on the wrong side of the fence to find out how bad this USA Patriot Act really is. The mentality that will harass the Muslims and Arabs, the institutions that will harass Muslims, will harass others. Measures first introduced against immigrants inevitably get extended uh, and applied to U.S. citizens. So over time, it's all of our rights that are at stake. So the first measures that, um, that, that criminalized speech or that, that penalized political speech were targeted immigrants, but ultimately became part of our criminal laws during World War I. The first measures that uh, imposed essentially guilt by association were introduced in the immigration law uh, in the uh, early 1900s, but were extended uh, to American citizens during the McCarthy era, and thousands and thousands of Americans were affected by that guilt by association. The first um, sort of ethnic-based targeting uh, enforcement was against uh, foreign nationals from countries whose uh, ethnicity we didn't like. Um, but uh, during World War II, that was extended and we ended up locking up uh, not just Japanese immigrants, but American citizens of Japanese descent. So whether it be you know, racial discrimination or, or, um, or penalizing speech or guilt by association, uh, uh, the, the measures are introduced against immigrants initially, but eventually get extended to uh, U.S. citizens. It created fear amongst the uh, Muslim community, and a lot of people have become so uh, concerned about stepping up to the plate and being an Ameri Americans. I mean, being American means that you have to stand up for your rights, that uh, you speak your mind, you have freedom of uh, worship, freedom of uh, speech. Well, none of this has really uh, flourished in our community after 9-11. Most people are scared to come up and speak their mind simply because they've seen what happens to those who spoke. Controlling the community is controlling their minds, uh, controlling their feelings. They will uh, all the time be watchful, uh, not to say 
uh, things they like to say. They will say things that the government would like to hear. Uh, not to do anything that uh, they show that they are full citizens who exercise their full rights. I think a lot of people are just very scared. Like, they wouldn't really talk about things or they would try to, like, distance themselves. So I think it's more of just, just trying to get by, trying to live their lives, you know, go to school, get a job, like, just live a normal life and not really so much involvement outside of that. Back in Tampa, the Megahed family sit down to celebrate the beginning of Ramadan, their first meal together since Yusuf's second arrest. I didn't imagine that we are going to sit together with Yusuf in the first day of Ramadan. Welcome back, Yusuf. I'm relieved, I'm happy that I'm out of the, this immigration jail. I was kind of expecting it that I be released, but not on a specific date, because the government uh, did not have a case. Like, they were just uh, holding me up for the heck of it. The government is profiling people, they're uh, targeting people. Uh, just based on, on their background, not of any crimes they have done. In my case, they, of my Muslim background, they were trying to say I'm a, a terrorist or that I have to be deported on terrorism grounds. They just want you to sign the requesting deportation and leave instead of staying and fighting your case. We asked Yusuf what he will do now that he has won. Who does he want to be held accountable for its years in prison? Will he continue to speak out on behalf of others who are facing similar charges? His father, Samir, interrupts before Yusuf can answer. Don't ask him many questions because the government okay. still now can make an appeal against him. Do you think they will appeal or do you think? I didn't know. They have uh, the right to do anything. Thank you.